we're going to look at a genital urinary tract disorder known as hydronephrosis. So this is a condition um, that results in dilatation of the renal pelvis uh, together with the calyces. And as a result, we have damage to the parenchyma of the kidney. So this occurs from a sequence of events that start from an obstruction that is uh, found somewhere along the tract uh, affecting the flow or the outflow of urine. So basically, in a normal uh, urine outflow, we know that the nephron is the basic unit of the kidney that um, helps in the formation of the urine itself eh, through the three uh, different um, processes of filtration, uh, absorption, and uh, secretion. So ultimately, the part of the nephron uh, called the collecting duct collects the formed urine from every nephron, and then they normally end up um, being delivered into one area. So we have a couple of um, pyramids, and at the end of the pyramids, we normally have the renal papill uh, papillae. So the urine will drain to the papillae, and then the papillae will actually drain the urine to some calyces. So we start with the minor calyces, and then they drain into the larger ones, which are called the major calyces. Now the major calyces drain into the renal pelvis, which is just this area around the renal pelvis. And then now th that is where we have collected all the urine that have been formed within the kidney. And then they flow through the renal pelvis through um, up to uh, through the ureter to the bladder. And then from the bladder, they're supposed to uh, get deposited for to, uh, or via the urethra. So normally it is um, a very seamless tract. And because of this kind of um, very continuous flow, normally urine will basically have very little uh, pressure that is needed for it to flow or for it to be formed and have an outflow. So you will see that this normal urine outflow is the one that is tampered with, therefore affecting this sequence of events that we have here. So now, the main cause of hydronephrosis is actually just obstruction. So how that ob obstruction occurs is what varies, but the main cause, actually the cause of hydronephrosis is obstruction to the urine outflow. So we've just looked at the outflow. So first of all, one of the causes of this obstruction, the obstruction can actually be either congenital and some of the conge congenital um, events are like um, when we have children who have urethral atresia. So the urethral atresia is basically when the urethra fails to open or completely develop uh, to open at the end. So you find that now there is no outlet for the urine. We can also have uh, renal atosis, or basically you have the kidney um, moving down from its original uh, position or being displaced from its original position. And as a result, we have now the kinking of the ureta because the, the, the kidney has been displaced. So this kinking will cause some sort of obstruction as well. We can also have some aberrant renal artery. So uh, uh, an aberrant renal artery is an artery that uh, joins from um, a different position from where it should join the kidney. Actually, at the kidney, we have the position called the helum, where the arteries, the veins, everything passes through. But you have an aberrant uh, renal artery which joins the kidney from a different position. And this aberrant kidney can actually block or cause some sort of an, an external obstruction to the ureter, okay? So because of this, uh, some of these congenital problems, we might actually end up having obstruction and we have development of hydronephrosis. We can also have obstruction that is acquired, and this is normally what we see, especially in adult patients, or so, uh, the, the hydronephrosis that is not carried forward from um, childhood. So you will find that um, it, we can have it from other conditions like foreign bodies, like a calculi. So if you have a calculi, a renal calculi, where you have the kidney stones, they will cause blockage and therefore we will not have urine being uh, flowing the normal way or flowing out, out, having the normal outflow. Therefore, it, the urine will back up. Then you have tumors, some tumors like uh, tumors of the bladder or even the prostate tumor the prostate cancer, as you can see here, they can actually cause compression and we have a blockage. Inflammation, several inflammation like prostatitis itself, urethritis or urethritis, 
they can lead to edema of that um, surface and then reducing the space of outflow. We can have uh, bladder, having an erogenic bladder, which loses its ability to contract because of lack of innovation. And therefore we have buildup of urine. So because uh, things like the sphincters are not opening. Then um, we have strictures, like a urethral stricture, and you, a stricture is basically like a narrowing in this case. So we have a narrowing uh, somewhere along the urethra that can cause some sort of partial obstruction. Um, now we also have, a, a sometimes um, when a woman is pregnant, uh, we have a gravid uterus. The, the uterus becomes so big that actually maybe when the woman assumes certain positions, they compress the um, urinary tract as well. So these are some of the acquired uh, obstructions that we can have. So in the event, depending on where exactly we are having an obstruction, we can end up having two types. We can have bilateral uh, hydronephrosis and we can have unilateral. So it's quite easy to know because bilateral simply means that the hydronephrosis occurs in the two because the urinary tract has it occurs as a pair. At least if we talk about it from the point of the kidney and the ureters. So if if it is affecting both sides, so both the right and the and the second uh, the right and the left side, then that would be called bilateral hydronephrosis. Then if it is only affecting one side, then that is a unilateral hydronephrosis. Okay. So if you look at this image, typically normally you'll find that bilateral hydronephrosis will occur if the problem is somewhere from the bladder or from the level of the of the urethra, because from this point, then it can affect both sides. However, if it has gone past the bladder, maybe now it is at a ureter stage, it will mostly affect just one side. So the side that has the blockage of the ureter, ureters, then that is the side that will be affected. So we can have different causes of like unilateral hydronephrosis, and we normally classify them into three main uh, groups extramural, intramural, and intraluminal. So if we take this image here to assume that if this is somewhere along the, the tract, the genitourinary tract, then um, if we have some sort of um, external pressure that is pushing this urinary tract to wall and consequently reducing the space, then that is called extramural. So as you can see this image here, the whatever is causing the obstruction is not inside the tract, but it is outside, far outside even the, the wall. So the pressure from outside the urinary tract causing obstruction. So this can be because of a tumor, for example, ovarian tumor that is growing outside the urinary tract, actually, or even a prostate tumor. Then we have intramural. Intramural now is an obstruction that occurs because of the pressure or a growth that is happening within the wall or in the muscles of the urinary tract. It is not inside, it is not outside, but it is within the muscles of the urinary tract, okay? So things like um, strictures or, uh, or ureterosyl, uh, this, these are examples of uh, things that actually can lead to this problem. Then finally, we have the intraluminal, uh, uh, intraluminal type. Basically here, obstruction is because of the existence of that agent that is obstructing within the lumen. So that is called intraluminal. So examples are like if you have now the kidney stone itself, or if you have the kinking of this um, tract, then you can end up having um, intraluminal uh, type. So we have extra intramural and intraluminal. So the causes of bilateral, I've said mostly this can be because of a problem with, at the urethra or at the urinary bladder. So the urethra pre problems can actually be a pinhole meatus of the urethra. Therefore, it's very small. We we have a sort of partial obstruction. Uh, if we have a benign uh, prostatic hyperplasia, if we have strictures or carcinomas, uh, in the bladder, we can have calculis or some tumors as well, and also sphincter dysfunction. So any of these can actually lead to bi the bilateral type. So regardless of what the cause is, this is the ultimate sequence of events that we end up having. So if if the factors are either congenital or if they are um, acquired, whether we're talking about bilateral causes or unilateral, depending, whatever you're talking about, 
Now we will start from that point. So you have that factor that is causing the obstruction. Okay. So whether it is a tumor, that will lead to some sort of obstruction. The obstruction will basically make the fluid, and the fluid we're talking about here is the urine, uh, to back up or basically to stop flowing outside. So it starts backing up and building up. This continues until it goes back all the way up to the kidney. And the ultimate event is that now the, the backing up continues and pushes the renal pelvis, causing dilatation, pushing the calluses and co causing dilatation as well. And ultimately, because of the pressure, we will end up starting having destruction of the nephrons. Because the nephrons now, because of the pressure that is building up, needs a lot of pressure to actually drain whatever it is uh, filtering or forming as urine through the collecting ducts. Now, because of this pressure, you start having the kidney overworking and it, it, it have hypertrophy. So you have hypertrophy of the kidney, consequently as a result of the increased workload. And the workload, as we have said, comes from the high pressure that is now building up because of the backing up of urine. So ultimately, that leads to the condition now we call hydronephrosis. If this persists, you will end up having a renal failure. Okay. So clinically, we expect to see uh, some, some elements. Now, when we are at either mild or moderate stage, sometimes it's very difficult to pinpoint any signs and symptoms. Uh, so sometimes it's, it is asymptomatic. But if it progresses, then mostly people will have pain in the renal area. So when you talk about like the flanks, the hematuria, because of the damage of the parenchyma, then we'll have anuria and oliguria. Remember that we have some sort of partial obstruction. So we are not releasing, we're not having an outflow. Urinary infection. Now, whenever in the genital urinary tract, you don't have proper outflow of urine. That means you're not having irrigation of that tract. We have the microorganisms now start uh, building or, or, or growing and then we have urinary tract infections so this will come with other elements like um, um, pain on urination or even frequency and sometimes urgency being there uh, we might also have formation of calculi because urine is not flowing outside so we are actually having some sort of stasis of urine then giving time for formation of stones or kidney stones Azotemia, this now occurs because now we are not having proper renal function. So we have we, we are not releasing the waste or especially the nitrogenous waste as we would want. Therefore, the nitrogenous waste builds back in the blood because the renal function test the renal functionality has been redu reduced. So we might have the hydronephrosis leading to a very large or some even to a palpable uh, level of the kidney. As in now we can actually feel it when we palpate. A distension of the bladder might also occur as a result, depending if the obstruction is at the urethra, because we are not draining the urine, the bladder now con continues building up and distending. So grading uh, in terms of the progression, we have already talked about basically how this happens, but we can grade uh, on what level or what severity of hydronephrosis we have, depending on what... Uh, is happening. So no dilatation, that means we are okay, grade zero, or basically that is when just hydronephrosis is starting. In grade one, we call it mild because the dilatation is, um, the dilatation of the renal pelvis uh, has, has started occurring, but the calluses are not involved. So it's only the renal pelvis that is affected. We have dilatation, some slight dilatation of the pelvis without involvement of the calluses. If you go to grade two, you have dilatation of the pelvis, and now it is a bit significant, as you can see, okay? And just some mild, mild dilatation that you might not even notice of the calluses. Now, in grade three, there is moderate dilatation of the pelvis. Now, together, as you can now see, dilatation of the calluses. So, the calluses have started um, dilating, and on top of that, the papillae have the phonises of the papillae or the papillae themselves that they've started um, flattening. Okay, remember they normally form something like a tip, but now um, they start flattening. <clears throat> and then ultimately, and all this is happening because the pressure is going back, back. So it is pushing everything back. So 
you can also see and apart from the flattening the other element is the cortex is starts thinning out becomes smaller and smaller or thinning out or thinner then the ultimately in a severe state where you have a extremely uh, bulging or dilated pelvis the the calluses have almost totally been uh, flattened because of the the calluses, uh, calluses have dilated and also we have involvement of the cortex becoming thin and now we also have totally damaged the parenchyma so basically this is a sequence of events and the reason is because of the building up of the backing up of the urine and then we we have the pressure going back so how do we diagnose the problem typically a physical examination will be able to give you some some um, clues here and there Things like uh, it might be able to palpate the, um, the kidney, there'll be pain, um, um, a report from the patient, things like dysuria uh, might, be, might be coming up. On top of that, urinalysis can also really help us together with a complete blood count. Renal function test is very important because we'll have um, the fun renal function test have being impaired. So if you look at elements like uh, BUN levels, or if you look at uh, creatinine levels, they will actually be elevated in blood. Then imaging, this is the confirmatory uh, tests that are normally done, and we want basically to see. So they can do an X-ray like this image here of the KUB, basically that is a kidney, uh, ureters and blood uh, X-ray, and they'll be able to give you a picture of what is happening. Other, other elements like a urography, a CT scan, an ultrasound, all those can be used. A retrograde pyelogram, retrograde pyelogram is very important. This is commonly used, and it's like they give an injection of a contrast material that is able to show um, how far in it can go. As in, we start have seeing um, basically the image. Like in this case, you can see how the pelvis is enlarged or dilated. So finally, when you talk about management, um, the goal, what we what we want to first do is to restart the free the free flow of urine, and basically that is because of the obstruction. So we want to at least do away with the obstruction. So if we have free flowing of uh, urine, then that that will be a very good start. Then also decrease any swelling that is there, and that reduces the kidney function uh, test or the buildup of pressure that reduces the kidney function. So. Initially, when we start, we want to also reduce the pain that the patient might be feeling at that moment in time and also prevent um, uh, the establishment of any urinary tract infection. So the treatment, depending, we said we said we have so many things that can cause this problem. It will depend on what the underlying cause is. If it is kidney stones, then we use things like uh, shockwave uh, lithotripsy or pyelolithotomy. All these things will help to try and remove the the kidney stones. If it's strictures, then um, a urethroplasty. If it is a urethral stricture or just a stricture, uh, uroplasty might help to um, create or remove that stricture. Uh, if we have the problem being the BPH or by nine prostatic hyperplasia, then a, trans a transurethral resection of that has to be done of the prostate. If it's um, a congenital problem and you're having a phimosis, then like treatment with uh, through circumcision might warrant. So in when we have very severe hydronephrosis, there's a, there's a procedure called the Anderson-Hines pyeloplasty. And it's an interesting procedure because what it does, it just makes an incision at the, at the, um, at the junction between the pelvis and the uh, um, ureters and, and then anastomos the area or the layer so that we end up having then a, now a very good continuous uh, flow from the renal pelvis to the ureters. Otherwise, normally you end up having a problem at that point. So that might also help together with other many um, surgical interventions that might be done depending on the level of um, damage that has been done. So thank you so much. That has been hydronephrosis.